Over the years, I have endlessly championed the licensed game. I've pointed out the good ones, had a laugh at the weird ones, taken great pleasure in trying to put them into context and seen just how well they represent the product they're tying into. It's fun! But there's also no denying that there are a lot of bad ones, and oh boy we've seen a bunch of them. There's the horrors of Dick Tracy on the microcomputers, the sheer incomprehension of a game based on EastEnders. If you have only surface knowledge, you know the likes of Superman 64 and E.T. on the Atari, but when you're a seasoned veteran, you know that Superman 64 isn't even close to being the worst Superman game. There's Superman on the Game Boy after all. And now today, we have another set of games that truly belongs right at the bottom, another contender for the worst licensed game of all time. But to cover it, we also have to march, once again, into the glorious, weird sector of old UK television. Forget Superman, he's worthless. He's nothing compared to Super Gran. We will get to the horrible games in due course, but it would be silly to just look at them without also peering into a British kids show that will probably leave anyone who's not British completely flummoxed and wondering just what on earth makes us like this. Why, on God's earth, does anyone decide that making a series about a heavily Scottish old age pensioner who has special powers is a very good idea? Why does anyone then decide to watch it, and then celebrate it so many years later, make it a fixture of Twitter accounts who endlessly beg for retweets by asking if anyone remembers Boy George and flushing out your balls into a pop sock over pictures of Bananarama? Just what is the deal with Supergram? I mean, it's not actually that ridiculous a story, but such things need a build up. It started out as a kid's book, and then it was adapted into a kid's show in 1985 by Time Tees Television, those responsible for service in the northeast of the country, meaning places like Newcastle. You know, the land of the Geordies, where Viz comes from, a place where blokes apparently walk around shirtless in the middle of December and, let's not forget, the new creative hub for YouTubers in the UK. You weren't ever going to get the swankier likes of London Weekend Television making something like Supergram. Anyway, what's it about? Simple. One day, an elderly grandma is going about her business when an inventor accidentally hits her with a magic ray. Now this could have caused her to explode into a horrific red cloud of blood, sinew and other assorted viscera, but instead it gave her magic powers and turned little Granny Smith into Supergran, charged with protecting the people of Chiselton, a town that would have been famous for making chisels if it weren't totally made up, from the evil likes of Scunner Campbell and his gang of muscles. No, not the soul band featuring erstwhile US Gold founder Jeff Brown. And naturally, her grandmother needs two children to assist her on these escapades, her nerdy little grandson and inventor Black's assistant, Edison. Episodes feature Super Grand doing all sorts of important tasks. Her powers give her Alan Shearer-esque levels of football skill, she can sort out a traffic jam in the blink of an eye, topple over crooks and other nefarious individuals, she can run at the speed of light, fly into the heavens, all sorts. It's all thanks, of course, to the porridge that she has to eat in order to retain her powers. You get loads of lovely cheap special effects too. The trail that Supergran leaves behind, using trampolines and trick camera angles to simulate her flying, cupping her ears to hear sounds from far away. The budget for this show was, as you might expect, very low, but there's a certain inventiveness about it, a very crude inventiveness. Gudrun Ura, who played Supergran, only ever had one stunt double too, meaning that she actually did most of the stunts herself. You know, just like Jackie Chan and Tom Cruise. The other thing about the show is, of course, the accents. The show is meant to be set in Scotland, and Supergran's accent might well be the thickest Scottish accent in the history of British television. Others who can't necessarily keep up their put-on Scott accent, as opposed to Gudrun's real deal, usually end up flipping from Scottish to Geordie and back again, sometimes in mid-sentence. Now, let's be honest, my American watchers, you folks aren't that good when it comes to regional British accents. So let's throw a few clips from the show at you, go into the comments afterwards and be honest about how many words you understood. And don't worry, southern fairies like myself tend to have a bit of trouble from time to time as well. But I don't want to be famous, Granny. 
Don't you be me normal old granny at home? Changing me dove and cooking me chips? Don't forget the Adventure Playground's depending on you. Yeah, well, it's no contest, is it? I mean, we all sort of strength and sort of speed. Oh, not to worry, hen. Sorting this lot out's easy peasy to a super grand like me. I'm going to replace him with this robot like while I kidnap the real bass from Battenberg and take him back to Merseyside with me. What could possibly happen in a wee place like Paddleton and Sea? Not a lot. Another notable thing about the show is the amount of guest stars that appeared in it. Over the course of two series and 26 episodes, there was a lot. First up there is, of course, legendary Scottish comedian Billy Connolly, who not only appeared in the show, but also co-wrote the theme tune. Others usually had roles as themselves with the odd character thrown in, and it's virtually a list of British TV greats. There's Bernard Cribbins, who a lot of younger folk probably still know today from Doctor Who. Speaking of Doctors, Supergrand featured one of the last appearances of the second Doctor, Patrick Troughton, with carry-on veteran and comic legend Charles Hawtrey also checking out not long after appearing on the show. Other well-known figures include Bert Kwok, Paul Shane, Joan Sims, Roy Kinnear, Leslie Phillips, a lot of actors. Guest appearances weren't just restricted to thespians, mind you. Celebrities made it on too. The show had George Best, the world's strongest man, Jeff Capes, Eric Bristow, Lulu, Willie Fawn, and Gary Glitter. We'll skip over that one quickly. A more heartwarming appearance came from British comedy demigod Spike Milligan. He apparently enjoyed his appearance on Supergrand so much that he became a fan and season ticket holder of Newcastle United for the remaining years of his life. Now you might well be baffled at this show if you've never heard of it. The production values are shocking, the acting is desperate, the plots have stakes lower even than an episode of The Joy of Painting. But the show was quite a success in its time. It's certainly well loved by those who grew up in the North East, of course, but it even had some success internationally. The show certainly made it to Canada, I believe, and it was actually one of the first Western shows that was sold on to Chinese television. Supergran really cornered the market for communist countries that begin with the letter C. In the early 2000s, a redubbed version of the show became a hit in Cuba. It's even won an International Emmy Award for children and young people in 1985, so it's not like the show was a purely regional film. I mean, Time Tees had a hit here. But alas, although a third series was planned, Time Tees decided to scrap it in 1988 in favour of producing more daytime TV quiz shows, such as the almighty Chain Letters. I suppose a legend like Jeremy Beadle doesn't come cheap. There were at points plans to make Super Grand the movie, but they never came to fruition. However, the show still has, in some corners at least, its fans and admirers. I'm not sure if there's enough for a super grand convention, you know, a grand con, but people remember the show fondly and Gudra Nua, the real life super grand, is still alive and kicking today at 92 years of age. People certainly remember the show a lot more fondly than they do the games. Hoo boy, have I got some corkers for you today. The Super Grand games, as you might expect, were released only on British microcomputers, and they were made by Timesoft, Newcastle's number one producer of computer game software, and a company that's most certainly worth a video all of their own someday, for various reasons. Still, it's only fair and right that a Time-based company produce a game on Super Grand, isn't it? And so they did. Two of them. Although one of them is little more than a rather lousy text adventure, and not that worthy of note. It's the first one that's by far the more famous, the one that we're really interested in here. It appeared on the Spectrum, C64, C16 and Amstrad. And yes, we'll be looking at all the versions. This game is certainly worthy. It is the most broken and terrible piece of micro software featured on this channel since the venerable Cassette 50. Maybe even since Squidge. I'd go that far. And hell, I've even got a bunch of popular YouTubers to back me up on this one. So just listen to these veritable continents of common sense. They're most entertaining. I think of all of the octogenary superheroes out there, I think you've got the best. And the game? That's shit. <laughs> Superground was, you know, ahead of its time in terms of, you know, female-empowered superheroes in the 1980s. Uh, Billy Connolly did the music for it, which is a great, and I have that on vinyl. Overall, it's a bit of slapstick fun. Nice, I'd like to see it brought back with Lulu in the role. There you go, Netflix, commission 10 of them, you bastards. <laughs>
Super Gran. Yes, yeah, Super Gran. Are you too young to know Super Gran? I, I, you genuinely have, I, not have, I, have I missed something? I need it, something it was a cultural icon. I missed something. I'm just thinking of like the Mighty Boosh episode with the, the, with the killer grannies. You're not that far off, off to be honest with you. It's not the right thing. She, she, she flew on a license. And she had a, she had a Spectrum game that nobody knows how to play. Everybody live streams and nobody knows how to play. Is, this is your one question. The one question for me is something I'm just going to look confused at the camera for. <laughs> That's what people will be watching the video. Will be. No, not really. No, that's it. <laughs> oh, super rad. The video game, presumably. Oh, uh, yeah. So my friend had that in a pack-in from his Spectrum, which he must have bought from Dixon's, because they're the only ones who did pack-ins like that. It was bloody terrible. You've got the incomprehensible start screen with the weird uh, bike thing she was on. Then some kind of platform game where the physics didn't work properly, and I can't remember anything beyond that except pain and sort of mild nausea. And if I remember, the Spectrum version is one of the better ones as well. Uh, I did look into it and work out which was the worst version. I can't remember now, which is a shame because mm. I could have sold you that information for 15 pence. <laughs> wow, well, what a deal. Super Grand. So yeah. As a kid, I watched a lot of Super Grand growing up and I actually loved Super Grand watching it. Yeah. It was a really weird show with a Scottish lady and um, she'd say things. But as a kid's show, I loved it. Um, if you're talking about the video game, that's a different story. <laughs> The really IT, was it ITV? Film, yeah. I think it's horrific. I used to watch it. No, I didn't used to watch it. I used to come on and I used to think this is the worst program I've ever seen and used to turn it off. I actually preferred the game version to the actual program. Wow. Which, Controversial. Yeah, whereas um, at least you can play it, kind of. Can you? It's more playable than the show, isn't it? The show is just. Well, by definition, yes. Yeah, yeah. The show is just um, unwatchable and the game is virtually unplayable, so <laughs> I give the game a slight edge for that. <laughs> um, I mean, I tried to play it on the stream when I was already quite drunk and I couldn't play it, so I don't know if that's because it's a bad game. Probably because it's a bad game, maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Let's start with the Spectrum version, mainly because it's the one I was able to get the most footage out of. Super Grand consists of four levels, all of which are different and terrible in their own way. In the first, you fly around in the skimmer and shoot down members of Scunner's Muscles Gang. This is really hard because your skimmer is huge and a single shot is enough to take you down. They only come from the left or right, so you kinda have to blow these bastards away as soon as they come on the screen if you're to stand a chance. After you've shot an arbitrary amount of them, you move on to Sheet 2. Now I don't get this one. All you do is fly left and pick up some fuel. There's one balloon that flies around which you have to make sure that you don't hit, but you'll do that so long as you just keep flying left and picking up fuel. It's poorly executed to say the least. Again this stage ends after some arbitrary length of time. The third sheet is the hardest of the lot. You have to drive to the next level and avoid colliding with Scunner's car that's also on screen. You don't actually have to be ahead of it, just don't hit it. However, this is harder than it appears. It's always tracking your movement and you have to keep adjusting your speed. Go slower and it automatically pulls ahead, go faster and it automatically falls behind. So keep doing this, but try and wait for an open space so that it's easy to avoid the car. It looks like a broken rendition of Spy Hunter and it feels like it too. The last sheet is the easiest. You simply have to perform a quick jumping sequence to get to the top, avoiding both the rising water and bombs from Scunner's chopper up above. Jump into the chopper, and that's it. Then the game's length is artificially increased by repeating these four stages once more, only with Super Grand being invisible. The only way this is represented is through her sprite being garbled, making you think that the game's gone do lally. But no, this is actually what it's supposed to look like. And yeah, that's super grand. The only award for all of this is, of course, a quick well done message before starting the game again from Sheet 1. I didn't mention, although you were surely able to hear, that all of this is accompanied by the very worst possible 48k beeper rendition of Super Grand's theme. I mean, good heavens. Quivens, as the Grand herself might say. And then the driving sounds from the third sheet are just even worse. I can't quite think of any worse Spectrum sounds than the ones that this game offers up. It's unlistenable to the point where you'd rather just keep the tape playing and listen to some loading noise instead. 
The controls for each section are also awful. I didn't mention that it seems to take forever to actually change speed in the driving section because it's so unresponsive, inevitably resulting in a crash. And of course, graphically the game speaks for itself. Super Grand may have been a low budget show, but this does not do it justice. And you know what? This is the best version of the game. All the others are, unbelievably, even worse, and I'll have to show you why. You may think that the C64 version offers better graphics and sound, and okay, you'd be right I guess. I mean the music is probably the worst usage of the almighty SID chip I've ever heard, but it is better than the 48k Spectrum beeper, and you can actually see the frickin' town in this game as opposed to some green mountains. But gameplay wise? The first stage is probably the most playable out of all the versions, but still terrible. You can use shields this time, and you know how much time you need to survive for in order to complete the stage. You also get a similar timer for the second stage, and now balloons are faster and more likely to hit you, especially if you're flying. However, you don't actually need to fly at all. Nothing that's on the ground will kill you. If you're on the ground, you don't use any fuel. So just don't bloody fly and concentrate on avoiding a balloon or two for the time it takes to finish the stage. This level is just simply broken as a concept. Level 3 is… I don't know if it's even possible. The road is small and the cars are now comically big. I wasn't able to get close to beating it and it's a total embarrassment, but I can show you the fourth level with a trainer and… I just have no idea. It now seems that jumping has been replaced by flying. But here's the kicker, you can't touch any of the platforms. If you do, you die, over and over. So yeah, in this level, you just press the button and die. I have no idea how you do it. This is ridiculous. And no, this isn't the worst version of the game either. That title belongs to either the C16 or the Amstrad CPC version. C16 could be a contender, I wasn't even able to get past the first level of this one as it just goes on and on and on. You have to try and use your shields here to have any chance at all and the controls are just a joke, but I wasn't able to see any more than this. I dread to think what the other three levels looked like. And so there's the CPC version, which for my money is the worst. I'm not sure if the person who coded this even knew what a computer looked like, let alone how to program. It's just so slow. You need some ridiculous degree of luck or liberal usage of save states if you're on an emulator just to get past the first stage because the flying is that slow. And it only gets worse on the second stage which is even more broken than what we've already seen. One balloon follows you very slowly. You two are also flying very slowly. You have to fly and therefore pick up fuel. But well just fly in a straight level close to the ground. You still pick up fuel that way whenever you pass a station. Literally, to beat this level, all you do is hold down left. Nothing else. Once again, I wasn't able to beat the third stage, it's just way too slow and uncontrollable. But I feel confident in saying that this is the worst version of Super Grand. All of them are shocking, but this is the one that I would say is perhaps the single worst licensed game ever made. And by this point, I'm an expert, so I would hope that my opinion on this matter carried some weight. A more shocking licensed game than Super Grand has perhaps never been known, so all that remains is to try and look behind the scenes and see just what people thought at the time. Did anyone actually think that this was good? Well, no, not really. Crash Magazine in particular savaged the game, bemoaning both the lack of the Billy Connolly theme song on the B-side of the cassette, and worst of all, the price. Believe it or not, Super Grand on the Spectrum was sold in the shops for a tenner. Seriously. 10 bloody pounds for this shite. This was kind of a theme with Tynesoft. Most of their licensed games cost a tenner, usually because most of them followed a similar theme to Super Grand in that they would consist of several different types of game and therefore could be sold for the full price. It was a similar story with their first license, the even more Geordie Alfiedazane pet. Believe it or not they would graduate from Super Grand to Superman. In 1989 they would make the heavily panned Superman Man of Steel, which was also basically a collection of minigames disguised as different levels and was programmed by Ian Davidson, who also did the C16 version of Super Grand. David Black, who did the Amstrad version, is only credited for that game alone. The most interesting credits belong to the Spectrum version, mind you. There's two credits for that. 
First there's F. David Thorpe, who did the loading screen. Soon after he'd be hired by Ocean, and would do several iconic loading screens for them. Now that may not seem like much, but consider that you would be looking at the loading screen for at least a good three minutes while the game's loading from tape. Suddenly it's more important, and he did some bloody good ones, several of them for games made by the almighty Joffa Smith. The game itself though, was programmed by Donald Campbell, who would actually go on to have a long career in the industry. In fact, before Supergran he'd already made a game for Arctic called World Cup Football, which would become far more infamous as the game that US Gold hurriedly purchased from Arctic in 1986 and turned into World Cup Carnival. And that's not all. After this, Donald Campbell would become one of the co-founders of Teatex, a company that would work with US Gold quite a lot and, yes, they would produce quite a lot of games that not many people like. And for all of that, Teatex are still a living company to this very day even if they're not in the games industry anymore, one of the few survivors of the era. Tynesoft, in the end, would not be a survivor. They went out of business in 1990. And yet their own history is very interesting indeed. They were the mad Geordies of the industry, with a whole raft of tales to tell, most of which aren't exactly PG to say the least. But they certainly had fun along the way. That's the impression I get from folks who I've talked to who served time in the company. Some of Tynesoft's young team would go on to really good fins, people like Julian Jameson, better known as Jules from Sensible Software, or David Mowbray, or Alan Cox, Kevin Blake, Steve Tall. There's quite a few successful folks who came through Tynesoft, and even if their games weren't necessarily the best, they probably deserve a video of their own. Supergran, however, was one of their first games, and undoubtedly one of their worst. Still, would you really want a non-Newcastle-based developer getting hold of this license? I mean, imagine what Ocean would have done with it, or US Gold, or Codemasters. It would have probably been so mediocre that there wouldn't have been anything at all to say about it. A show as low budget and as murky as this one? Perhaps this is the game it's best suited for. Bye for now, and a Merry Christmas to you and everyone at home. Thank you for watching this video on the almighty Supergran. If you like the video, please do like it, follow me on social media, comment, subscribe, bell, blah, blah, all of that. And uh, support me on Patreon, where you can support these weird videos and join this list of awesome people that I'm going to thank right now. Alexander Jazeri, Andrew Dalton, Andy Capt, Daniel Briggs, Daniel Dave Taylor, Dave Cork, David Rose, Dustin Cooper, Gary Pinkett, Geordie Alex, James Loveridge, Jason Goy, Jason Stevens, Jace Alexander, Lee Norris, Loms Daniel, Martin Pataki, Nicholas Tristan, Peter Jack, Filter Prog, Potter Margell, Pixels Limited, Quandy X, Rachel Maxwell, Ren Bimon, Rock2000, Seth Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Yoka Operator, Zach Roach, and to all the rest of the community, thank you so much. Goodbye!